And getting into the into a boat, Jesus crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise and walk, that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. Well, Pastor Larry, you've had quite a weekend, a full weekend already, Friday night, Saturday, with Confirmation Retreat. So thank you for the opportunity for me to be with you this morning to bring a message from Matthew 9, Jesus' encounter with people. I had the opportunity to be with you once before, but it wasn't in person. It was just a bit over three years ago, I think December of 2019, when Christ was in a capital campaign, and Pastor Larry had arranged for me to speak at one of those worship services. Well, I was on my way back from Leadville on Friday, and already there was some rather iffy weather going on, and a serious storm was predicted, winter storm was predicted for the weekend. And I think it was already Friday evening we canceled my coming in person or even trying to do that. And so what we did was to do it virtually. Well, not that because of iffy Wi-Fi and all of that, that we wouldn't try to do it on Sunday morning. So I set up a primitive, and I mean very primitive, recording studio in my family room. And got the phone out, turned it on, videoed myself, sent it to Pastor Larry, and he presented me on Sunday morning to you. And I don't know how many of you were able to be here at that point. But thanks for giving Karen and me the opportunity to be with you once again. And actually, uh, after I was elected, our family reunion, elected district president, our family reunion was in Breckenridge, and, or Frisco, actually. And we came together to worship with you. That was my first, I don't know if one would call it official visit to a congregation. It was more family visit, recreational, and so forth. But it was good to be with you. So as Pastor Larry mentioned, I had the opportunity to install him as associate pastor at Peter Lutheran in Arvada. And over the years, I've had the opportunity then to see him grow in ministry and as a missionary, to see his uh, genesis of salt of the earth, and to see his acceptance of the call here at Christ, and the development of an RSO, Summit Mission Alliance. So it's wonderful to see his leadership, his vision, and his heart. His heart for people who reside in the terrain of the mountains and in these communities. And to seek to endeavor how to bring the gospel to Jesus Christ to those who do not yet know him as their personal savior. So thank you for your involvement in that as well. And it's great to see pastor and people working together to love, to serve community, to bring the message of Christ in word and deed. Appreciate your hearts in doing that. 
Well, in our gospel lesson today, we see the hearts of some people also. And we're going to look at that under the theme, their hearts and our hearts, under the theme, follow Jesus with a pure heart. There are three groups of people that we'll look at. First group is the paralytic, the paralyzed man and those who brought him to Jesus. Second group, the scribes. And Matthew, or Mark and Luke add some details throughout the story, and I'll be adding those as well in these parallel accounts. And we know that there were Pharisees present along with the scribes. And the third group then is the crowds that were there listening and observing what was going on. So they're in Capernaum. That's actually Jesus' place of residence for three years during his ministry when he's often in other parts of Galilee, Judea, and the Jerusalem, and even into the Decapolis, which is an area that is not uh, part of the Jewish area. And so there are people that have gathered around because Jesus is back in town. And he could be at Peter's house. Peter and his wife were residents in Capernaum. Anyway, he's at someone's house, and it's packed. Standing room only. And there are crowds outside around the house. And the reason for that is because Jesus is one who has been teaching with authority different than some of the other rabbis had been teaching. And they want to hear what he has to say. And Mark and Luke tell us that there are people, or I think it's Luke, tells us there are people from Judea, Galilee, and even Jerusalem. Now that's you know, several days' journey, and, and so is Judea. But they are here in Capernaum wanting to hear what Jesus has to say. Well, there is a group of, of people who bring a paralyzed man, the paralytic, wanting, of course, to have this man healed because Jesus is performing various kinds of healings. The problem is they can't get inside the house. So what are they going to do? Well, they're pretty creative. Mark and Luke tell us that they go up to the roof of the house. Now that must have been something to observe. These men going up probably an outside staircase, going up, bringing this paralyzed man up to the roof. And people inside begin to hear the commotion of a racket going on and tiles being removed from the roof and suddenly there's light coming in and there's noise. What kind of a tension span do you suppose people have listening to Jesus at that point? And finally they get an opening big enough and they lower this paralyzed man down in front of Jesus. And then it's interesting, and I have a question for you. And I understand this is much like what I did at Resurrection in the City. There's congregational participation. So what did Jesus see? What did Jesus see? People looking up, they see a paralyzed man looking to see who dropped Jesus, who dropped the man down. What else did Jesus see? Faith. Did you catch that in the reading? Jesus saw their faith. Isn't that amazing? Well, certainly he could. He peers into the heart 
fault of all of us. What do you suppose the extent of their faith was? And, and we're talking about not just the paralyzed man, but the people who dropped him down in front of Jesus. What do you suppose the extent of their faith was? What did they believe? Pardon? He had the power to do something and specifically to heal. What else do you suppose they believed about Jesus or might have believed? He's merciful, compassionate. What else? What kind of a concept do you think they might have had of Jesus by this point? Of who he really was? A healer? Do you think they might have thought of him as God's son? As the one who is the Messiah? We don't know what was in their heart. Uh, we don't know what they might have believed for sure. That it's, it's not for us to know that. But anyway, they certainly had faith. And so the next question for you is, what does Jesus see in your heart? What does Jesus see in your heart? Is there faith there? Is it a weak faith? A questioning faith? A strong faith? A faith that when there is a challenge or a question in life, you come to him in prayer? Believing who he is? what he can do, that he truly is the Son of God? Well, certainly the, the faith of the paralyzed man and those who brought him is a beautiful example of faith. And Jesus says that, in essence, that's what he is saying. He saw their faith in what Jesus could do. Well, let's go to the second group of people, the scribes. Scribes are ones who are experts in God's word. They spend a great deal of time studying the word and interpreting God's word. But the scribes have an ulterior motive for being here in the presence of Jesus. They are sitting right down there in the front row, probably along with the Pharisees who are also there. And they are listening to every word that Jesus says, and they are looking for a way to trap him in his teaching. His word has gotten around, and there are all kinds of people following after Jesus. And the scribes and the Pharisees are upset because they can't, see that this truly is who we see Jesus as, the Son of God. And they're just waiting for him to misspeak. And Jesus obliges as far as they're concerned. He looks at this paralyzed man and he says to him, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. What? Well, there's compassion there. Jesus, you know, take heart, have confidence, be comforted. My son, your sins are forgiven. Well, why did Jesus say that? And certainly sin and sickness are related. There was no sickness before Adam and Eve fell. And sickness is a result of the fact that there is sin in the world. Not 
do we, we, we do not want to directly connect people's sin and sickness. There's, that's a whole other topic. I'm going to be careful when we go there. But the scribes are feeling we've got something on Jesus now. They are thinking blasphemy. And they're thinking it in their hearts. And Jesus says to them, why do you think evil in your hearts? He can peer into their hearts as well. Only God can forgive sins. That's how they see it. And if Jesus is forgiving sins, he is a pretender to be God. No man can forgive sins. They do not see who Jesus is. And he goes on. And from there, and he says, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, why do you think evil? For which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? Well, how do you know if someone's sins are forgiven? How do you see the evidence of that? But if someone says rise and walk and the person rises and walks, well, that's pretty clear that the person has the authority to do that. Well, Jesus goes on and he says, but that you may know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. He says to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed, and go home. And what happens? He gets up. He picks up his bed, and he goes home. Well, the problem is with the Pharisees and the scribes that all they can see is the evil. And that's where they're stuck. They see the evil in Jesus or think they do. Basically, they're good people. They're religious people. They're doing what they think is right. They think that they are guarding God and his word, but they're misguided. How is it that sometimes as Christians following Jesus, we can have less than pure hearts. What does that look like among the, in the Christian church? How are we as Christians following Jesus sometimes with less than pure hearts? Yes, Paul. Excellent. That is so true. And, and those who are outside the church sometimes see that of us in the church, and it does not bring them into the church. It drives them away from the church. What else? We're human. We're, we're definitely that. Yes. Any th specific things that uh, you... Vaccines and masks. <laughs> Vaccines and masks, yeah. Because we know Jesus would. <laughs> but uh, if someone has a different stance on it, on their religious stance or their self righteousness or whatever, then they'll have to be a little bit more careful. 
Yeah, we, we've certainly seen that the last three years, haven't we? The issues over masks, the issues over vaccines, and instead of being tolerant and respectful of another, we think our way is the right way and insist on our way is the right way and are critical of others. And, and in this area, we can be very self-righteous and in other areas, we can be very self-righteous thinking, boy, they sure don't do things the way I do. You know, and, and, and we put people down. We're critical of people because they don't do things the way we do as well as we do or as pious as we are. Um, Sorry, cut off the mic. I'm totally hurting every teacher in life, but I want to preach with you. I don't have to, but we even use uh, it in that um, faith as a weapon. Faith over fear is what we say or, or whatever, and, and we can e even start weaponizing uh, something like that to justify our Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> this preacher's done. We'll continue. Yes. We're still sinful beings, and don't you think that the devil and evil gets harder in congregations? I mean, Christians and then you know the people that they are faithful, it gets harder to dig in. You you are absolutely correct. Uh, he's looking for how he can destroy the church, how he can destroy people's faith. And so where's his work, where's his place of business? It's in our hearts, isn't it? To try to lead us astray. And to be, and, and pit one another against each other. And is the vaccine mass issue a good example of how he succeeded in doing that? I think so. Other other thoughts. Okay, making faith a matter of the head and not of the heart, and acting more on the intellectual issues and debating faith and theology and all of that instead of really caring about those who need us to love and care and serve them. Excellent, excellent point. And, and here we see compassion, don't we? Jesus' compassion for a paralyzed man. His compassion for others in, in so many settings and that they have the correct teaching as well. Any other, any other thoughts there? Okay, we'll get to that. That's, that's an, excellent, it's an excellent question. That's the third group, the crowds. So um, got a little bit more on the scribes section here. They continue to bird dog Jesus throughout his ministry, scribes and Pharisees all over the place, hounding Jesus, following him. And they come up with all kinds of things. Finally, finally, they have a plan and what they're going to do. Judas Iscariot plays into that plan. He betrays Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, the evening of Passover. Jesus is arrested. He is placed on trial. And before Pilate, or not before Caiaphas, the high priest, and the whole Sanhedrin, like 70, 72 religious leaders, Jesus is placed on trial. And Caiaphas asks Jesus, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus says, I am. I am the Christ and I will be seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Well, Caiaphas explodes. He rips his garments 
and he cries out blasphemy, and Jesus is guilty of death. The, the, the sin of blasphemy is punishable by death. They turn him over to Pilate. Pilate wants to declare him innocent, wants to set him free, but the crowd keeps crying, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate turns him over and Jesus is crucified. That's God's plan. They follow it. They see that it happens. He pays for all sin on the cross. And you are forgiven because of what Jesus has done. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. He's the one who gained that for us, forgiveness of sins. He gives that power to the church. Pastor Larry, this morning, just a few minutes ago, said to you by the authority and the command of the Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive your sins. You also have that authority. When someone sins against you and confesses their sin, you have the opportunity to forgive their sin. When they come to you in confession, confessing what they've done, you can use the authority that Jesus has given and announce to them and forgive their sin. The example of Joseph this morning, his brothers, well, you know what they had done to him. They had sold him into slavery. And because of the lie of the master's wife where he was a servant, he ends up in prison. And then he's forgotten about by someone who is freed. But finally, finally, he comes to power. And then the brothers come. And eventually, Joseph and brings the father and the families into, into Egypt. But then the father dies. And the brothers are fearful now of what Joseph might do. Dad's gone. It's his opportunity to get revenge. And when they come to him, remember what he said. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good, that many people would be kept alive. He comforted them. He forgave them for their sin. Jesus on the cross forgave those who put him there. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. So the scribes are thinking evil, but now, well, that's, that's an opportunity for us to be careful of what is in our hearts as we follow Jesus, or we follow with a pure heart. But now let's look at the crowds. And what, is, what does Matthew say? They were afraid and they glorified God because God had given such authority to men. You've already mentioned something about that. So that, that whole thing, how does that strike you? Why were they afraid? Well, for me, I think it's something about the holy, if, if God were to be in, come down and make himself visible, Jesus make himself visible to us, might we have a little fear in our hearts as we look back at our lives and we know the sins that we have committed? And yes, we've been forgiven. But might there be some fear there? If the presence of the holy can do that. It's more than just what we sometimes talk about as rever fear as reverence. This is fear of being afraid. And I think that's what it's about. And they glorify God, who has given such authority to men. They give God the credit for what Jesus 
is doing. They're on the right track, aren't they? They're on the right track. They respond in an appropriate way to Jesus. So now as we consider these three groups, how do we follow Jesus with pure hearts as we live our lives in this 21st century? What are the important things in following Jesus with a pure heart? He's the authority. His word is the word that guides us. Okay, good. Don't let your mind get in the way. Follow your heart. Compassion. Compassion. Even, even, and, and see, here's the temptation to be judgmental, isn't it? Who, who really needs our help? And, and sometimes we look at people and the mistakes they've made in life and what they're now reaping because of what they've sown. And, and we may think, they don't really deserve compassion. Well, who are we to be the judge? Other, other thoughts here. I'm, I'm sorry. Having a childlike faith. Yeah. Um, we want our faith to be strong. But sometimes it's weak. And, and when we encounter challenges and questions and so forth, Trust, trust like a child. Truly believing that Jesus can. He may not change the whole situation for us, but trusting that he will get us through. Other, other thoughts. Forgiving. Wow, that, that surely comes through in this, doesn't it? Um, Jesus starts us out that way as, as he forgives that person's sin. So there are going to be people who offend us. Our spouses are going to offend us. Our children are going to create problems. And, and sometimes we even need to ask their forgiveness. But instead of being too, uh, setting ourselves up as authorities and in a position of prominence or power, um, we have to be able to forgive others. And sometimes we need to be forgiven and, and to be humble and ask for forgiveness when we have sinned against others. Other thoughts? Yes. Okay. Yeah, love your neighbor as your, as yourself. Uh, and sometimes uh, we we don't even love ourselves, and but uh, the the love your neighbor. That's in a sense that's the second commandment, isn't it? Love God, love your neighbor. Those are the things summarized that what come before. Okay, great. It's great to be with you. It's great to be with you, and thank you for your participation. You know, as we follow Jesus with pure hearts, um, compassionate hearts, uh, hearts that look out to others and, and forgiving hearts, we, we want to do all of that with purity in our hearts and, and let God bless that. And, and I pray that God will go with you and bless you and your relationships with others as you follow Jesus. As a congregation and as Summit Mission Alliance, that as you love and serve your communities, that God will bless you. Amen. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. 
unto life eternal. Amen. Amen.